we're just going to get guiding us started now. Um, we're with uh, IDIA, um, Institute for Digital and Media Arts. Um, so we let's see, do a lot of things with um, virtual worlds and um, other video game type stuff, um, animation. And primarily we're just going over today uh, photogrammetry, which is a relatively new uh, way of scanning things. Um, and it's a it's a cheap, easy way to uh, scan things uh, without using any uh, expensive equipment, just your camera. And we primarily use it for um, uh, small objects in virtual worlds. But it's also good at archiving things, not accurately, but um, just getting a good idea of what they look like and virtualizing them. So, <clears throat> Um, so of course, you know, photogrammetry, while it is great technology, it's very cheap, it is also not the most precise thing. Um, so it's you know, pros and cons there. Um, it is only as precise as you make it be. Um, whereas, you know, with a laser scanner, you go out there, you press a button, it's going to scan at the same resolution every time, no matter what. When you go out with photogrammetry, it really comes down to the technique that you use when you're out there with your camera um, capturing the scene. And there's, um, that's kind of what we'll get into eventually is, you know, these specific techniques and how do you really create a good quality um, model from the very beginning um, just with your capturing techniques. Um, and so there's, um, you know, a few different ways you can use uh, photogrammetry. <clears throat> or, you know, different purposes that you can use it for. Um, of course, the common element in all of these is that you end up with a 3D model of some kind, and then, of course, you know, it's what do you do with that model and how do you use that for different projects or different purposes. Um, the, uh, one of the easy things, of course, is to 3D print with your, um, with your photogrammetry capture, um, which I've managed to do a couple times. Uh, with some success. We've got two models here. We've got the Easter Island head and the Statue of Freedom. And both of those were actually captured with um, my iPhone camera. So no, not even like a really high quality camera, but just a simple iPhone. Uh, and there's even an app for photogrammetry called 123D Catch. Um, and it is an app that you can download on your phone, and it even gives you kind of some suggestions of how to take your pictures as you go, and gives you some guides and references to as to like, when to take a picture as you walk around your object. Um, do you want to pull up 123 d Catch? Those are plastic. They were printed with our MakerBot Replicator 2X printer. Uh, that is a whole other can of worms that we won't quite get into, is the 3D printing. Uh, but that particular printer does have its own little idiosyncrasies at times. Uh, so while the model came out you know, digitally, is pretty flawless. Uh, the actual act of getting the printer to produce that model is taking some trial and error. <coughs> We do have, the, there is another printer in the building that does what kind of material? Sand or? It's the, uh, yeah, the Z printer down in the wood shop. Uh, you know, of course you can, you know, there's different types of 3D printers, of course. Um, so this is kind of a, a cheaper, kind of low resolution sort of output, uh, but then you, know, you can use the nice big professional 3D printer down the hall uh, and get some very high quality results. Um, so this is the uh, the app I mentioned just now, One Two Three Catch by Autodesk. Autodesk actually has two products that I know of right now um, for photogrammetry. Um, One Two Three D Catch is more or less made for kind of the quick, dirty, cheap way of doing it, just with an iPhone, and you can send it to Autodesk, and they'll do all of the legwork. Believe in you can even just do photogrammetry and order a 3D print from your phone in the app, and they'll do all the processing for a fee, of course. Um, but, uh, 
Yeah, there's some. So, for example, the uh, this white 3D print here that I was passing around. Um, so this capture here. So what we'll see when it pulls up is that um, there's actually some parts where it didn't resolve very well. Um, that statue is actually 20, 25, maybe 30 feet high. Um, so it's very difficult to get um, close in on the upper end of it. So you're kind of standing on the ground and a little disadvantaged. Um, and the navigation of here is, of course, really painfully difficult. Um, it won't rotate to the side. I'll try and do that. Okay. Um, so yeah, right here you can see it was kind of a, a gallery sort of setting, and um, it kind of fits it in really well with um, both the texture information, the actual picture that it takes, as well as the, the 3D information. Um, so that's the, the nice thing here is that you can see some details that if you were only to look at the wireframe mesh, you wouldn't really see because it's kind of smoothed out. Um, but then when you overlay the um, kind of the painting of the actual photograph on it, you can combine that with the mesh and really kind of sense um, kind of the, the depth of certain things. So you could see up by the, uh, the neck especially, it just kind of blends from her torso up into her face. If you were to you know, back out a bit, the, uh, the shadowing that you see there, if you stand back a bit, it kind of gives you the impression that it is caved in. So again, there's some you know, pros and cons there as far as how well it works. And that came out due to a process of how we took that model very quickly, um, which is, I don't know if we want to jump into how we go about circling the model. Um, we'll get there. But okay. I think. Um, so yeah, this is, again, this one, two, three, you catch, um, kind of the, the cheap, easy way. The other way is also very cheap. Um, there's a program called Recap Photo uh, by Autodesk, again. Um, and it is, um, you know, I really don't even know how to describe the difference, but it's, um, it's more built for the digital SLR route doing this, uh, where you have a nicer camera, uh, and you can go take your pictures and then later upload them through your computer to the servers that Autodesk has, and it'll take all those pictures, process them, and kick back your model. Um, so for example, we've got this capture here, um, which I did just the other day. This is actually a school project of mine. this for, um, say you built a study model in studio, and you really wanted to capture it, you really felt like you got the geometry just right, and you want to bring that in and start modeling with that in Rhino or something. Um, you can take a photogrammetry capture of your study model, pull it into Rhino, and then start modeling on top of that or with it, um, and create you know, a new model or extend it for more detail. So Actually, we can show, we we'll flip over to Rhino. Um, so right here, this was something much, much larger scale. Uh, this is downtown Muncie, actually. Um, and actually, let's start with the website. Okay. Um, so the, uh, a couple weeks ago, went downtown and took several images. Uh, this was done with something on the order of I think close to 200 pictures were all used to, uh, to make this model. Uh, and the intent here was to capture the space here. This is the Chase Bank building downtown. This is Walnut Street. Um, north is this direction, south is down here. Uh, we've got Casa del Sol right here. Um, so, you know, for example, if you've got an architecture studio and classic 
architecture studio project to pick an empty lot and build a building there. Um, so if you want to capture this lot, you could do that. And then you've got you know, the exact proportions of everything relative to each other, of you know, your, your limits and your boundaries. Uh, so you can start to model according to um, you know, your, your surrounding environment. So then what I did with this was take this capture and pull it into Rhino, and then you, know, you could conceivably start to model the ugliest looking building ever, right there in empty space. Um, but you can do it with the knowledge of um, you know, how is it going to look proportionally from the very get go. Um, you bring it into Rhino and you can just start modeling right away and know, you know where are the other windows as far as height goes, what's the rhythm, um, how does everything look, is this building too wide in the facade because all of these ones are smaller. So rather than you know, going there and just taking pictures and trying to draw it up and plan in plan and section. Um, you go to a site, do a photogrammetry capture, and immediately you're working in three dimensions from the very start. So I think there's you know, a lot of potential there for architecture students to be able to to use that as a um, as an initial kind of launching point for studio. Actually, the, um, the resolution where it's actually focused on is pretty decent. Um, you can actually get you know, store windows, the signs in the windows, um, and get the depths of those windows themselves. And uh, the convenient thing too is that also, um, it's something I neglected to do, but you can go to the site and you just take a tape measure with you or a laser measure. Um, and you just have to physically take one dimension, just anywhere. And of course, the bigger dimension, the better. Um, but then you take that number, find those same corresponding points in your digital model, and scale the model according to those two points, and all of a sudden, everything pops into scale, and you're modeling in real world units um, from the very start. So I think that's another huge advantage to being able to do this in a, a studio setting. we can get into then uh, how do you actually create a, uh, a photogrammetry capture um, and really it comes down to two very different methods um, or it really depends on what you're trying to capture um, and those two different things are if you're capturing a single object that you can move around or are you ca capturing a large object that is around you um, so we call those inside out or outside in scanning depending on your frame of reference um, so inside out scanning is like that downtown scene where I wanted to capture the space between buildings. Um, so it's the more complicated of the two methods. Um, and so the technique I've used and kind of still been developing um, is to kind of walk around the space and you continually take pictures. So you go to a spot, um, take several overlapping pictures. Normally you want to have at least 50% overlap between every set of pictures, um, you know, take some angled up, some looking down, some level, move to a new spot, and do the same thing, and keep doing it over and over and over again. Um, the other method for, is much simpler, um, you've got your object that you're trying to capture, and you just walk around it and always stay centered on the object as you orbit around it. Um, but also you want to do this again from high and low and at least mid-level. Um, you want to make sure that you've got um, the model captured pretty fully in every single frame. Um, and also there is what we call the, the rule of four, um, which is something that shows up in the, the recap software that you can use as well. Um, you can do this stuff kind of manually. Um, but what it is is that you want in every picture, um, and it, gets to be a little tough to think about, especially when you're taking 200 pictures. Um, 
but you want every picture to have at least four distinct elements that the software will be able to pick out as a point that it can compare between any two pictures. Um, so you want to say if we were back in this Muncie scene, we can just look at the pictures themselves, um, I think. You know, like the uh, uh, saturation and shadows play a big part in this too. Get into a little more detail there. Um, but something like this cornice line is something that the software will be able to pick up with these these windows. Um, and so you want to try and have that information showing up in at least four pictures. So that allows the software to really determine, okay, here's a point, here's a point again, here's that same point again, and then by the time it sees it four times, it knows for sure that, okay, this is a point, and we're going to recognize this and try to build around it. Um, so that's one thing. And then also, on the inverse of that, still with the rule of four, is that you want uh, not only four of those, I think I was just saying that, uh, sorry. Yeah, you want four of those sites, kinds of points to show up in each picture. So every picture you take, you want to see four points that it will be able to recognize. Um, and then the opposite of that, also, you want each of those points to show up in at least four pictures. Um, so you've got that cornice line showing up in four pictures, but in each of those four pictures, you've got other points that it will also see in four more pictures. Um, so you can start to spiral out of control a little bit, and it's maybe a little difficult to conceptually at first, um, but especially um, you know, just around the object that you actually want to capture, make sure that you get that information. Um, so like for instance, when I was downtown here, down towards the end of the street, um, you can see it really got pretty messy down there, because uh, it didn't quite see it in enough pictures to identify what it was, how far away it was. Um, it's like all these buildings were the other side of the streets, just barely out of frame there, so it didn't quite catch it. Um, whereas, you know, this side of the Chase building shows up in at least half these pictures, um, so it was able to create a really strong face for that, at least at first. Um, Does the pattern with function work at all with these? Um, are you talking like on an iPhone? Yes. I haven't experimented with that, um, but I would say no. Um, we've tried some stuff with the GoPro, which is a very wide angle lens, which is essentially what you're creating with a panoramic yeah, photo. Um, and with that, the distortion that you get from having yeah. such a wide angle starts to throw it off at the, the outer edges, um, so it has a little trouble trying to reconcile that and figure out um, how it compares between different images with such wide field of view. So you generally want to keep things pretty tight. Um, and you can zoom in on things um, with your camera. If you've got a you know, SLR camera, you can physically zoom in on something um, with your lens. Um, it can account for that. And it'll figure out that okay, this is a close cropped, more narrow field of view picture. Um, and I can also help you, you know, if you've got details like on that statue, if I would have used a real camera um, with a nice lens and zoomed in and taken several pictures of her face, that probably would have resolved that neck issue and it would be just kind of this blobby uh, sort of face. Uh, and I can you know, use that for both you know, creating the, the 3D mesh as well as the, the test information a little more precisely. Um, one of the things you have to be aware of when you scan also um, is big, wide, flat, empty spaces. It's um, so like with the side of the Chase building here, um, there's enough distinction between, um, you know, it can kind of recognize these windows are a little lighter than the rest, so it can use that as kind of an object to track. Um, and all the grid work really helps as well um, to, to figure out 
you know, how each image matches up with uh, the next one. Um, but in this model, I had some issues with the wings on the airplane. And what happened here was that, you know, the wings are just these big, flat, white patches with no distinguishing features at all. There was none that the software could pick up. Um, so this is, for whatever reason, a common error that it produces when you do that sort of thing. And it just creates these holes in the middle of your surface. Uh, so one way to get around that is, you know, if I were to take in duct tape or something out there and just put some kind of color or a distinguishing mark, you know, just a single strip of tape across the wing, um, that would have given it something more to grab onto and identify in you know, several different pictures and it would have been able to figure out you know, uh, that the wing was actually a straight section rather than a, a hole. Um, because what it does is when you've got just these wide open spaces, can't latch on so it can't determine the depth information. And so it just kind of gives up and craps out. It says you get nothing. You get these giant holes. Um, what else have we got? I guess one of the, the overarching themes here is that um, as far as capturing your scene, um, you want to minimize variation. Uh, so like lighting, especially, um, if you're doing an outdoors capture, as the sun changes, or if it's a partly cloudy day and the clouds are moving in front of and out away from the sun, um, your lighting is gonna change a lot. And so that can sometimes throw off your capture. And so when you've got the opportunity to control your scene, um, try to control every single aspect of it. Um, lighting being one of the big ones. Um, so, for example, if you're trying to capture a small object and you're doing an outside-in capture, this airplane in the model, and you're working around, um, one thing you want to avoid is standing between your object and the light source, because uh, that'll cast a shadow. And it'll be there in one picture, then you move away, light streaming on your object, now there's no shadow. And so it'll look at the shadow and use that as an identifiable trait in one picture. And then since it can't find it in another picture, it kind of gets confused and gives up for there. So one of the ways to do that is if you're outdoors, try and go at you know high noon when the sun's coming almost as straight overhead as possible so that you're not casting too many shadows. Um, if you're indoors, try and do um, overhead lighting and diffuse overhead lighting is the best. Um, so when we outdoors, if it is you know, a sunny day, wait for high noon. If it's a overcast day, that's actually probably your best scenario for doing photogrammetry because you get this soft, diffused daylight coming from every direction, no strong shadows, um, nothing to really mess seen up too much. Um, okay. Maybe we should just uh, try uploading one thing to show an example. Maybe um, Persephone, I'd say. Let's see, your account for a recap is over. It's here. We'll go home. And we're going to show just how we go about doing it and selecting the images. I go to, <clears throat> let's see here. What's that Drobo doing? Yeah. This is one of the models we uploaded to Sketchfab. Um, we have, it's probably one of the, it's one of the good ones that uh, came out. And we tried it with uh, several other uh, god statues here in our uh, library. This is on Sketchfab, which is kind of like a YouTube for uh, 3D models that you can just throw up there and start to gain a lot of process. Um, Persephone, Persephone was from the art museum. And in these pictures here, let's see here. 
I'm going to go to large icons. Here's about how many photos we shot of her. Let's see, control A, uh, 84 items. And I think these are the pictures that were good and turned out well. When we, um, looking at it from this view, from large icons is a good way to judge things when you're going to upload it, uh, images. Because you can see like, well, this one is fairly light compared to down here, which is very dark. And realize that these images, like those textures are going to be trying to map on to the same place. So it's going to could cause some problems with uh, how it shades it. Because it's taking textures from multiple sources of dark and light. And one other mention here, go over, like you can see a light up here. We usually have to change the white balance of the camera because if a light is not in the scene, it could become very dark, as here. And that's one thing to look out for that you can see from this overall view, like really dark here, lighter here. And in, this is the clean sample. I think we took up to 300, 400 photos, which is a low sample. I would say if you really want a good, really, if you're really determined to get a good statue, go for 1,000 images, take 1,000 pictures. Maybe 100 might turn up to be OK, because some will be blurry, some will be um, too dark, and some will just not have the correct information to connect to other things. So these images, we um, go back to Recap, which uh, Chris has an educational license. you want to talk about the educational license of Recap? Um, sure, yeah. Um, so with Autodesk, I don't know if you guys are already in the educational community um, for Autodesk, where you can create an account with them. Um, and I did mine years ago, um, and it's still active, and it gives me full access to all of Autodesk, so you know, AutoCAD, Revit, Maya, uh, the entire library of Autodesk software is yours for the taking, um, as much as you want including um, Autodesk Recap, gives you full access without any limitations. Um, the free, non-educational version of Recap limits you to only using, is it 50? 50 images. 50 images, um, which is enough for a very kind of rough model um, that gives you just a taste and leaves you wanting more, so then you buy a license for this. Unless, of course, you get the educational account, which gives you all, all of the access for free. Um, and I forgot to uh, pull up a link for that to, for the actual process, but I'm um, pretty sure all it needs is uh, verification through a .edu email address, and uh, you get everything you could ever want. So we're using the educational package. I just went to create, start a new project, and let's see, process. Symphony number two. Uh, you'll get this. Um, when we make projects, uh, a lot of them are doomed to failure. So I go through this and fire off probably up to 20 different projects to see which one comes out good. Um, there are some options. Ultra, Preview Ultra gives you better, um, a better model, uh, more detailed with all of those. It also, of course, takes longer for the server to do that. So if you want to see just, first off, if you've got enough pictures to make a decent model, you can do a quick preview. Um, we will probably kick that back in, back to you within, I mean, depending on the number of pictures, maybe half an hour, an hour, two hours. Uh, whereas if you go for the ultra high quality, generally you'll upload your images, send it off, um, and just wait for tomorrow morning when an email comes back and tells you that it's ready. Do it. Yeah, so that's why it's good to fire off 20 or so, so then you have 20 emails coming back and see, you can check each one and see if you have to fire off 20 more. Um, and here's the options, OBJ, RCM, FBX, IPM, RCS, uh, OBJ we'll go with for now. I'm just going to do the preview mode, which is what I'm used to in the public account, which has 50. Uh, smart cropping, I don't usually go for. Um, if it's not turning out well, I might turn it back on. I think I can show the, an example of that. Um, smart cropping is, it's really actually a 
pretty simple feature for um, recap, and I used it for this project actually, the, uh, this model capture. And what happened was with the original one, um, this one without the smart cropping, um, it captures literally everything. Yeah. Um, so you can see, here's the model, and here's the entire room that the model was sitting in. Um, so smart cropping will look at the pictures, and it'll say that, okay, this stuff shows up in literally every single picture. So that's going to end up in the 3D model. Yeah, it just says, this, this is the majority. Machine. I'm going to concentrate yeah. on this. And not bother using computing power and texture space to compute everything else. So that model right there, while it does show up, it probably has a lower texture resolution because all that te texture space was used for all the stuff in the background. So that's where you might want to go for smart cropping. Mm -hmm. So with single objects. Right. Um, back. And of course you'll want to probably turn off smart cropping to something like the downtown ones you capture because you're covering so many different things that it's probably going to get confused on what it won't know what you were actually trying to focus on, which is everything. So I actually haven't run that with smart cropping, but I have to imagine it probably wouldn't turn out too well. So with this single, this single um, bust of the statue, we're going to use smart cropping. And let's go ahead and upload images. And let's see here. Um, I have a different way of going about this than Chris probably does. Um, since I like to fire off several images, and I like to get a good idea of what I'm going to get right off the bat, um, I always hold down control and just start grabbing things that look like a good sampling. You could just do all of them. Let's see, 84. I'm used to just doing 50 in a public account. But since we have all these images as 84, we can just grab all of them, drag and drop. <coughs> uh oh, it's going to upload. It's going to upload. It's going pretty quick for each image right here. Um, but that's what's going on with that. Maybe I'll wait while this is going and open up a different project just to show some examples. Let's see. Here's an example of a statue that was taken not by me, but um, John in uh, Italy. So this is the good thing about uh, making these statues. You can have someone somewhere else, like out of the country, and just tell them to go through a procedure of taking as many photos as they can. Now here's a problem, this is when some people show up, and that ruins your targeting. So that's another point, is to just try to keep um, people out of the picture as much as possible, even though that's usually impossible if it's a public area. So this is a museum space. You can tell John had to boot back up a little bit here to um, get the sides, because I'm guessing, let's see, is there a wall on the other side? Usually there's just not enough space to get a good representation. Oh, that's the uh, text, the UV outline that holds all the textures for the model. Two images. So this is just a solid circle, no high pass, no real low pass, maybe just two times around with, um, I think this was with an iPhone. And let's see, that model, that uh, turned out as an FBX, Throw that into Maya. Oh. Okay. Might have to adjust the camera clip size. But if we go to six. We can now see what came out of that. We now have a full 3D model. And we didn't, you can see we didn't use any kind of smart cropping here because you could actually go back here and say, oh, I tried to grab another statue too. 
but um, this came out pretty well for a really quick job. For, and this works good with animations if you just need the background object really quick and don't feel like modeling it. And even if you do want to model on it some more, it gives you a good starting point. Of course, since you know, you can see, maybe you can, these cameras here, they actually represent the photos where they were taken. Sometimes with 3D Catch, they can show you each spot where they showed up. And it's only a circle around here. So this is why, of course, you don't get a top for the head. Of course, that could be done if you had a drone or a camera with a stick, camera attached to a stick. But ideally, that's part of the three passives, going like around mid-range, low range, high range, and then you want to get the top. And usually, the bottom is impossible. There's something to make that up. But that's a quick model we got out of that. So back over to recap, we see all these have just uploaded to the server. So there's add more images if you want. We'll just hit next, because that sounds good. Here's a part where you can review on the site uh, what pictures, if you want to go through. But I already reviewed them in Windows, so I'll just say next. Project su submitted successfully, that's it. <laughs> so then it goes in queue here, and uh, it's not actually processing, it's just waiting at the server to go through and be meshed together. But eventually it'll start showing you a percentage, and if you don't want to, of course you don't want to wait, it'll just send you an email saying it's done, and you can go look at it. And from there you can either view your model in the web browser here, or you can just say, go to download, download your FBX, or OBJ, or your RCM. There's your model. And going back to um, something I mentioned earlier was minimizing variety. Um, also, not only in your environment, but on the end of your camera as well. Um, I think we kind of briefly touched on that once or twice. Um, but ideally, if you can, set your camera to full manual um, and set your settings and lock them in and don't change them at all. Because um, as you take a picture and the, uh, the f-stop changes or your shutter speed changes, uh, that means that the light that ends up creating your picture has changed. Um, so then you've got two pictures that were supposed to look similar but have very different colors or different shading. Um, so you would end up with this kind of splotchy sort of effect. Um, so a way to kind of avoid that or work with that, um, the technique I've used is, um, first of all, when you take your pictures, you try to want to keep everything in focus. Um, so if you open up your f-stop really wide, uh, that gives it plenty of light, keeps your entire depth of field in focus, um, gives it more opportunity to find sharp points that it can pick out as um, tracking points between different pictures. Um, when you have blurry images, um, those just don't work very well for the software, and it just kind of gives up on trying to find a point somewhere in that cloudy, hazy spot. Um, it just kind of throws that picture away and uses a different one. Um, of course, when you open up your f-stop really wide, um, you have to slow down your shutter speed as well. Um, to get enough light in there to create a good scene. Um, Here's an example of what he said. These pictures turn out well until we get about here, yeah. where the light just gets so exposed, it covers the face. Mm -hmm. This thing's up here, it just uh, ruins the texture. And you've got all those, those glare spots and effects. Um, the capture settings of the camera um, changes. You can even see the, the color tone. It's kind of this, it's much warmer in these pictures, and then those kind of around to the left side there, you've got the sunlight coming in, really cooled everything down, and you have these blue hues. And so then, while it can still find different tracking points, the, the quality of your actual texture in the end, um, just the image that's painted on, is going to be much rougher and splotchier. Um, so going back to the actual camera settings you want to use, um, start by turning your f-stop way up as high as you can as far as you're really comfortable with. Um, generally, you know, most cameras will start down about 3.5 and go up to 16, 20, 30. Um, it depends on your camera. 
Um, for one of my more recent captures, started with f-stop, I think around 8 or 12. Um, so it's much higher than you know, your low end 3.5. Um, of course, again, once you open up that wide, your shutter speed has to slow down, which means you're more prone to camera shake, um, both while you're holding the camera or just simply pressing the shutter button. Um, so what you want to do is, um, if you've got a good controlled environment where you can do that, um, actually I think it was with this model here when I was capturing it, um, you just use a tripod and a two second timer. So press the shutter button and just don't even touch it and let it kind of stabilize from after just that act of touching the button make it shake a little bit. Um, so give it two seconds to kind of settle down, it'll snap the picture. Um, and then you've got a very good, high quality still image uh, that captures everything, keeps it in focus, and it's bright enough to uh, you know, show everything rather than everything being crushed in blacks and being in the shadows. Uh, your ISO, of course, you need to keep that balanced with the other two parameters. Uh, if you go up too high, of course, you get the, that grainy sort of artifact to your pictures. And if it's bad enough, it can actually create artificial tracking points that don't actually exist. Um, if it's got all these really grainy, splotchy points from having a really high ISO, um, you'll see like, these little green and red spots and think, oh, this is a green spot. I see this green spot here, here, and here, and here. And then we'll use it over and over and over again in a long space. Um, it doesn't give you a very good effect. Um, make sure I've got that one covered. Um, this is a really yeah. great spirit, Munzi. Um, all we wanted was a uh, texture, just the shape information. Um, so we didn't apply any of the texture information. And it was going to be used just to scan another 3D prototype, uh, just for a model. Which um, I should also make a point of the pictures for that. <clears throat> sort of system, um, in a way, where you can go back again and just keep adding pictures, deleting pictures. Um, you know, if you go back on the day, you want to pull out the bad pictures, you took better pictures, substitute those in. You don't have to completely wipe the entire project. You can just switch out some pictures, resubmit it, and um, wait for it to finish, and hopefully you get a better result. Um, additionally, you can also just run several projects of slightly different areas. And then you get all these different 3D models and you can pull them together and overlap them into one file at the very end. Um, so if you've got a great big empty space that you want to capture, uh, like you know, an art museum gallery or a church or something, um, you know, you're going to get all of that kind of a, a certain sort of mesh density, a certain resolution and a level of detail. Uh, but then if you want to zoom in on something uh, very critical that you want in high detail, like, for example, if you were in a church and you want to get the altar or the organ or something, um, you can do another recap uh, of just those details. And so you've got your big model that holds everything, and then you can, you know, if you're good with mesh editing, and you can pull all these different models into a program. Um, you can carve out the the low quality area in the big model, um, and toss in your detail model here and one here, and then at the end you've got a pretty comprehensive model that covers everything in varying levels of detail. And oftentimes on the side here, the pictures I was looking at, sometimes, I haven't seen it in these two scans, but usually on the bottom it will show you the pictures that were not used. And you can take that as a hint that you should use, like all these are perfectly fine and they connect to each other, but the pictures on the bottom that say we're not used, you can. The ones you want as a bunch of unused. Okay. Yeah. These last ones I was starting to get better and better and was actually able to use 
every single picture. Um, but like when I had the Muncie scan, it, of, I think about 200 pictures I submitted, it only was able to use maybe 150, 160, 170. So there's this whole stock of images at the very end that it just kind of gave up on. These are the raw images of uh, Appeal to the Great Spirit. You probably can't see it um, in here, but they're real. Some of these turned out really blurry. These are all the raw pictures, probably 200 or so. And I deleted a lot of these, uh, a lot of the blurry ones. So that's why I say you gotta just keep taking as many pictures as you can because you might end up throwing away 100 once you get back. And going back to a model to rescan it um, could be problematic because the lighting could have changed, and that might throw off everything. There's also what we talked about with uh, solid colors. I knew that this table was going to be a problem, so sticky notes and a pencil, or you know, just about anything I could find, I kind of threw on the table. That was done on purpose, drew a bunch of little symbols that can be tracked. I would often say, throw more stuff on there, lay down a mat, a tablecloth, or put it on the carpet. Because in this scan, the table did not so much come up. And yeah, but from those Im from the images here, that is how we were able to get appeal of the Great Spirit. Which we hope to 3D print sometime soon. Questions about the process on any level? Any specific questions about technique or the programs or camera settings? I have a question about um, if you're going to print out the Cyrus Dallin Appeal to the Great Spirit, do you mm -hmm. contact um, the estate to print out an artist object? I mean, those were cast sculptures. Yeah, um, we're talking about the licensing issues. Yeah, to um, reproduce it. I don't know, and I feel like we are kind of, I mean, we took those pictures with the permission of Minatrista, who so we were already coordinating with that, and they knew what we were doing, we were just doing research. Um, you might want to investigate artist yeah. rights because of copyright issues. Because I used to work in a museum, and museums don't own the copyrights. Yeah. Especially uh, for artwork, but for uh, sculptures, especially because you know, 30 museums around the country will own that. Yeah. Um, okay. And then there's the artist estate, they own the copyright. <laughs> Appeal, we were contacted by the Muncie government to uh, make another model because one of the models cast that they had, the scan was lost. So that's why they wanted us to do that. Yeah. I, but I, that is a good question for that's that stuff. And I think it's kind of, since it's such a new technology, um, different museums aren't very aware of it. Uh, so anybody walking around that looks like they're just taking pictures on their iPhone can be capturing something. Um, it's just like that. Uh, East Island had there, I got at the, um, the British Museum in London, actually. I just like, walked around with my phone and took 40, 50 pictures with the app and set it up, and now I've got a copy of the East Island head from the British Museum. Um, so you, know, you could do this in Italy with the Statue of David, or the more contemporary pieces. You're going to have a bunch more trouble with artists that yeah. um, you might not with Cyrus Dallin, but with um, like a Warhol, if you did a Warhol sculpture or something, oh. you know, his foundation is strong and they, they really monitor what happens with the intellectual property. Yeah, I wonder if they would, I mean, if, there, if people are allowed to take pictures of it. I wonder where they would draw the line between taking a picture of it and taking a 3D capture of it. I don't think it's the 3D capture is the problem necessarily. It might be the printing of it if you're creating yeah. another sculpture. That's a sculpture. Yeah. 
Yeah. And so far, any of those cases have come back to be honest. But that could open a can of worms with this technology coming out. A lot of museums aren't quite onto it, but they do have sections like museum here. They always have traveling artists. You're not allowed to take pictures of them, and they right. enforce that heavily. Right. I feel like the problem would come with uh, the intent of what to do with 3D capture, whether you try to get a financial benefit off of it or not. I know uh, a lot of museums, they'll allow you to uh, pay in the museum, uh, right then you're making a copy of a copy at that point. And there have been other artists who've uh, put that kind of thing into question, like the Marble Man picture, uh, where there's a famous picture of the Marble Man, and then there's another famous work that's a picture of that picture you know, putting that same idea in the question. So I really think it has to do uh, with the overall intent of what you're doing. So if, you, if I print it off and I just want to put it on my shelf, I think that's one thing. If I start going into mass production yeah. and selling copies of Andy Warhol sculpture or anything. Yeah, it's similar just as making a clay model of it yourself and you claim it as a, it's a knockoff. But, um, most of the sections we're saying is for like animations, it gives you quick models uh, to put into an animation or a virtual world, or like Chris is saying, um, a good way to map out geometry that you don't want to make yourself and uh, plot possible buildings and pre -vis. Can you do anything with just a few images? Yes. Um, yeah, actually, uh, if you want to go to my makeup. The one I was showing here is just eight images, I think, just going from left to right. And there was no point in getting the back because there's a wall back here. You can't get behind it. But there's one way to go about it. And we only just want to see what this looked like. Because it's a um, certain type of sundial, the cauldron solar. What uh, what do you want to show? Uh, I've done some experiments with um, actually just Google Earth of all things, because um, you know they have the Google Street View you go along. They've got useful 360 panoramas every few feet down every road in the world. Or That's most of them. Anyway. Pretty much what your Google Earth is doing with all the, the trees in your house. Mm -hmm. um, Located in your house now. Yeah. So I've tried a few different things. Um, one has worked, most of them haven't. Um, even the one that worked is pretty rough. Uh, but I did this just with um, the Robert Bell building here and picked out um, every street view shot that included any part of the Robert Bell building, cropped it down, and of course this is you know, the super low resolution of Google Earth Street View. Um, and it gives, at least in some parts, a somewhat reasonable reproduction of the building. Um, and this is the, the north face of the building. Uh, this is Petty, turns down to McKinley here, and the Bell Towers over in this area. Um, so the best images were shot kind of right here along McKinley and then wrapped around a corner to Petty uh, before it kind of goes out of frame. Um, and it did a, a decent job. You know, it got this block and then the, the return back to this space. Um, it even captures kind of that beveled edge there and then the setbacks of these little windows as well. You can see how they're indented there. Um, so yeah, this was all done with just 18 pictures were actually successfully stitched, and then another eight didn't quite make the cut. Um, for, I don't know why, I think that's a perfect picture, but just didn't quite agree. Um, for whatever reason. So, you know, it's just, you know, some low res photos, and just a few of them, you can get some halfway decent results. I guess this highlights kind of the, the issue of repetitive um, surfaces 
can see the picture in the background here is what was the image that I pulled out of Google Earth. And then you can kind of see this lobby mess that is the model. Um, and with all these windows being so evenly spaced and repetitive, it kind of puts it in the wrong place uh, because there wasn't enough distinguishing elements to say that this window is this window, not that window. So I kind of thought that you know, these windows on the side there were the last ones on the block, and I kind of had some trouble with that, apparently. This is just 18 photos that got stitched. <laughs> Here's a very quick in progress um, for interior space of uh, the legacy room and the cornerstone, cornerstone center of the arts. Um, I did this with a public account. And when you get there, it's better not to just, there are ways to just walk around, take several pictures like what Chris did with um, downtown Muncie. Um, however, with this room, I will show you that it's better to look at it and then try to physically divide it into sections when you're taking pictures. You'd, so I would only concentrate, say, on one wall first, like this section. And, oh, it's not going really fast. Let's just go for large icons. I would just concentrate on that one wall and you can see me moving around the room just taking several picture, pictures from different angles like I see this one part the side of the stairs. I want to get a different view of the side of the stairs so we can know from just how it's angled that it's going to be a square type shape. And I just went around getting just this one wall every angle of and then I would move on to the right wall. I mean, this room's kind of the ship of a sh old sailing ship, so I just call it starboard. <laughs> so then just moved on to the next wall.
And as in this image, um, there are some things that are just going to be downright impossible to capture, like these chairs here. There's too many of them, and they have too many reflections, high highlights on them, and the highlights keep changing. So something like that, if you were to put this together in another program, as you can see, none of them actually came out. It tried to um, in this other section, which I'll show. Like, uh, let's see here. Window, let's see. Corner. Let's take a look. What did I hide? Oh, the corner. This is just another example of me not, one image not coming up correctly. It just kind of screwed up the entire corner. So, what I did was I went back into recap, looked at my pictures again, say, yeah, these, and just tried to find all the pictures that had that said corner where it screwed up. Then I only uploaded the pictures of that corner. We'll just go. And I'll unhide that and brought that in. And then slowly I can start to take that section here within, say, Rhino or Maya and try to bring in that whole corner. And you can see here, I tried to get the chairs, but I did, yeah, can't quite get behind them. I couldn't get under them. I couldn't do all that. In that kind of case, if you were trying to make this room and want to look as good as possible, I would suggest just recapping one chair, concentrating on that chair back and forth, and then just duplicating it several times throughout the room once you got it. So far, the recap's good, just uh, collecting certain textures on the wall. One of them is, let's see, even small, small variations like of a uh, facade or motif, which could be seen with the Arapacus here. Let's go to This is a model constructing, um, there's several hand-drawn parts, like the pillars, the top, but there's these very unique uh, motifs running along the side. Which, let's see, can't get the texture activated. Hmm. Texture's not coming through, but I can show you within my recap Sign out of here. Sign out. Sign out. Oh, yeah. Yes, here. <coughs> This is a pub this is just a regular public account anyone can sign up for. I was able to get the whole side of this uh, building motif. And it does have a certain three-dimensionality to it, even though it's very um, very shallow. And that's how I got that section. I believe it's only yeah, just 13 images. And I'm not even the one that took these photos. But it was able to pull that kind of height out of that wall. So, that's one way to get the textures.
It's immortal to let you know. Do you guys have any examples where you try to clean up the geometry and uh, project the textures onto uh, onto that? You mean like wipe the textures clean? Like, you know, the geometry that comes from uh, uh, ground truth is you know, obviously kind of dirty, so, I mean, mm -hmm. do you have anything where you'd like retabo, cleaned up? Yes, as uh, you saw with the With uh, Appeal to Great Spirit, we had to clean that up because some things weren't coming out right. Uh, it was hard. We just couldn't get the camera underneath the horse. It had to smooth some things out. And the topology was really bad. Um, but if I open that back up here, A simple took in a ZBrush and doing a DynaMesh became a very ugly but uniform meshing of just horizontal and vertical squares. But it upped the resolution from what it was. So much cleaner, not just triangles everywhere. Can you show me the original waterframe? I don't believe I have. I'm not sure where that is. I'll look for it. Yeah, it's not on my. It's not on the recap. I removed that because the cloud was getting too full. But yeah, Dynamesh and um, other topology programs are really should be included there. If there's any other questions, that should be it, I think. Mm -hmm.